the polar regions. For decades, their siren song has lured humankind, adventurers, scientists, militaries, and more. Its beauty is matched by its terrifying danger, and for most of human history the only way to get there was by ship. But this proved extremely difficult. The dense ice packs in these areas would normally render passage through them impossible for regular vessels. They would freeze, stuck in place, until the pressure would literally crush them to kindling. It wasn't until the late 1800s when a team of Russian engineers and architects, working under an intrepid vice admiral, came up with the idea to address this problem using technology. Enter the Icebreaker, a special ship designed specifically to do exactly what you'd expect. Break through stubborn ice that would otherwise be deemed impassable. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs, and today we'll look at the incredible ships that blazed the trail to the Arctic and Antarctica, the mighty icebreakers. Before the age of dedicated icebreaking ships, most vessels that attempted to cross over sheets of ice were in danger of being nipped. This sounds like no real concern for a large ship, but in reality this meant that the vessel was entirely paralysed by massive flows, squeezing like a vice from all sides, rendering it completely immobile, sometimes in a span of just 15 minutes. In some cases a ship couldn't be recovered after becoming nipped. Stuck in the ice, the pressure from all sides would become too great, and the ship would simply disintegrate. But today, icebreakers are in no real danger of these kinds of disasters. Their durability in these conditions makes them essential to military and commercial travel through ice-heavy waters. But what makes an icebreaker different to a normal ship? And how did this technology evolve? To fully understand how these powerful and useful machines came to be, it's important to step back and understand how humans fared while facing the dilemma of how to cross waterways that were completely sheathed in ice. As always, the most primitive solution came first in the form of manual labour. In the early days, men would set about breaking the ice apart with hooks and axes, working for days on end to clear waterways by hand. But of course, this was an incredibly labour-intensive and slow job, not to mention extremely dangerous. As early as the 1300s though, the process of ice breaking began to evolve. As trade began to ramp up, and the need for quick ice removal to ensure safe passages became paramount, the process would need to be considerably sped up. In 1383, a Belgian shipbuilder named Jan Soyen created a basic kind of ice-breaking boat that was a sensation for its time, but the technology was primitive and on a tiny scale. It wouldn't be until the 1800s when the icebreaker as we know it today began to truly take shape, thanks to a Russian vice admiral by the name of Stepan Makarov. Makarov recognised the need for a sea route that could be operated year-round between Europe and East Asia over the Arctic Pole, and knew that there were advancements to be made in ice-breaking technology that would make it work. Large Russian ports like St. Petersburg were closed for months at a time thanks to the ice, and certain Russian rivers would be closed to shipping traffic for upwards of an entire year. Despite the seemingly obvious benefits that this would offer to Russian commerce, Makarov actually struggled to have his ideas taken seriously. Scientists at the time seemed convinced that Makarov was proposing an impossible task, and that the ice was simply too thick and dense to be broken through by any force, man or machine. See, in those days, polar explorers would sail ships as far into the pole as they could before it became inevitably stuck. They'd then alight with dog sleds or balloons and then trek as far into the polar region as they could. Makarov envisaged a dedicated ice-breaking polar exploration ship that could smash a clear path through and it would change the way humans could explore the North Pole forever. Suddenly, the dog sleds and the epic journeys on foot would be a thing of the past, because the crew would never need to leave their ships. Contemporary scientists shunned the idea, but soon his fortunes began to shift. After giving a lecture at the Marble Palace of the Academy of Sciences, which was attended by many highly influential business people, politicians and members of the Imperial family, interest in the project began to spark. Makarov had said that, it isn't the question to build icebreakers or not to do it, but it's the question to build them now, or wait even longer. Finally getting the backing he needed, Makarov was able to plan and build the world's first steam-powered polar icebreaker, called the Yermak, introduced in 1898. Makarov oversaw the design, construction and maiden voyage of this innovative new vessel, 
and the Yermak would go on to become one of the longest serving icebreakers in the world, finally being scrapped some 66 years after her launch. Yermak used a simple, clever set of engineering techniques to achieve her goals. First, Makarov needed to find a way to drive the ship relentlessly onward through the ice in the first place, so to that end she was fitted with a strange layout, no fewer than four powerful steam engines, each one producing some 2,500 horsepower. The most unusual thing about this arrangement was that only three of the engines were mounted at the back of the ship on the stern, while one was mounted with its own propeller below the bow of the ship. With 10,000 horsepower total behind the Yermak, she'd be able to drive forward against the ice, but now she needed to break it, and for that, Makarov needed to find a clever engineering solution. Simply smashing into the ice at 90 degrees wouldn't achieve much, even with all that power behind her, a perfect 90 degree push against the ice would be futile. Instead, Yermak would need to crush it downwards with her own weight. The hull received a strange shape. The bow was angled at 70 degrees, and the stern at 60. Then her sides were angled 20 degrees outward from the keel. It meant that as she was driving through the waves, at every direction Yermak would meet the ice, and then be forced up and over it by the angles of the hull. The ship would ride over the ice until the sheer weight of her would have the desired effect, pushing down and breaking it at its weakest point. Yermak would then ride up and come down and do it all over again. This way, the ship could plough forward through the ice and smash it at up to 2 metres or over 6 feet thick, which is a very impressive achievement. But Makarov wasn't done there. He had the power he needed, and he had the clever hull shape that would get the job done, but now he needed to protect Yermak from the ice itself. Now, we all know what ice can do to a ship. Over a decade after Yermak, an ocean liner named Titanic was sent to the bottom of the ocean by an iceberg. Yermak was just as vulnerable. She would need to be heavily reinforced to prevent damage and flooding. So first, Makarov had the ship's hull fitted with a double bottom, a kind of inner skin that would trap water flooding in from any damage below. Now that was standard for most ships of the era. Then he added double sides as well, essentially giving the ship an entire second inner hull. He then divided the hull into no fewer than 48 watertight compartments. If one or more were to be breached, a powerful pump in the centre of the ship would take the water and fill the other compartments to mitigate a list and prevent the ship from capsizing or sinking. For the purposes of scientific study, a series of powerful cranes and winches were fitted so that the crew could cut blocks of ice, then hoist them aboard for study. This wasn't just a utilitarian ship designed to clear waterways for trade, she was a pioneering kind of research vessel as well. And all the way through her early days, Makarov proudly oversaw her work. Yermak broke through the ice well, although in the end they removed the forward propeller, it was at risk of being damaged. On breaking up the ice that blocked the entry to ports on the Baltic Sea, Yermak proved more than adept. In fact, on her maiden voyage she broke through 160 miles of ice, over 250 kilometres. Shortly afterward, word was received that 13 ships were caught in dangerous ice flows and they were at risk of sinking. Yermak steamed to the rescue and smashed a highway through for them to escape. In the end, more than 40 ships were able to successfully navigate through thanks to the pioneering ship's efforts. But Makarov wasn't totally satisfied. He wanted to take Yermak into the open ocean and test her abilities up in the thick polar ice, which was an intimidating effort. Here, Yermak struggled. Her engines just weren't powerful enough, and she was brought to a halt again and again. The crew would need to reverse the ship and then charge the ice at full steam to smash their way through. But then Makarov noticed that the friction of the ice acting against the hull would bring the ship to a quick halt, and she'd have to do it all over again. For Makarov and his team, it was a fascinating experiment, and it's testament to their trailblazing engineering that Yermak survived and was even able to gather fascinating insights into the density and buoyancy of polar ice in the region. Clearly, the icebreaker had some way to go yet, but this early attempt was a triumph that helped science understand the polar region even better. Flash forward to over a century later, and again, the world's largest icebreaker is Russian. But this beast is a far cry from the revolutionary, but primitive, Yermak. That ship had been 300 feet or 91 meters long, but this modern day generation of icebreaker is almost twice as long. She's called Arctica, and she is a behemoth in almost every sense of the word. 570 feet or 173 meters long, and some 33,000 tons, the ship 
actually use the similar principles Yermak did to smash her way through the ice. See, most passenger ships have bow shapes designed to slide sufficiently through the water, but Arctica, like Yermak, relies on an angled stem to force the ship's bow up and on top of the ice where she can then crush it under her 33,000 ton bulk. Yermak had used a suite of steam engines to power her along. For their day, they were the most advanced propulsion system at sea, and the Arctica is really no different except that it's not steam that's driving her through the ocean and the ice, it's actually nuclear power. This monster is propelled by two nuclear reactors, creating power for electric motors capable of producing some 80,000 horsepower. Three 20 megawatt electric motors drive their own propellers, each some 20 feet or 6.2 meters across. This brute force is enough to push Arctica through the ice up to 4 meters or 13 feet thick at a continuous speed of 2 knots, that's 2.3 miles per hour or 3.7 kilometers per hour. Now this is performance that Makarov could only have dreamt of back in 1898, but it does come at a cost. Arctica is the lead ship in a class of seven, each costing about a billion US dollars to build. The program is designed to clear a path through the Northern Sea Route, an expanse of open ocean that follows the old northeast passage through the Arctic. This will make sure that goods can be transported year round through those lucrative sea lanes, this, in part, actually fulfills the dream that Makarov had had over a hundred years ago and actually even vindicates his ambitions. He was completely right. A dedicated ice-breaking vessel could smash its way through polar ice, but sadly it wouldn't happen within his lifetime. He was killed in action in 1904 in an action against the Japanese Navy at Port Arthur. But his ideas and schemes live on. The icebreaker, as we know it today, follows many of the early suggestions that Makarov and his team had made and implemented on their plucky little icebreaker, the Yermak. Arctica was introduced in 2020, and along with three of her sister ships that have been completed, have succeeded in escorting ships through the dense polar ice. I have to say though, it's a little bit disappointing that of the seven ships planned for the class, not one of them is intended to be called Yermak or Makarov, which is a real shame because in my opinion, either one would be a very fitting choice. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Oceanliner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy. And I'll see you again next time.